on behalf Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I am delighted to welcome you all to tonight's Infrastructure Thought Leaders series, Facade Design. And I'm also pleased to advise that we are joined by over 1,500 engineers online, both here in Australia and beyond. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to elders both past, present and emerging. My name is Amanda Rogers and I will be your host for this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that tonight's seminar is being hosted with our industry partner, Brickworks Building Products. Brickworks is one of the world's largest and most diverse building material manufacturers. The company has built an enduring reputation and are recognised for their innovation, professionalism and dependable products and services. With a broad product portfolio and manufacturing and sales facilities across Australia and North America, Brickworks is uniquely placed to service the demands of the building industry. As Brickworks Building Products expands globally, they continually foster and advance their products and brand, leading the way through design, style innovation, sustainability and collaboration. Tonight you will hear from two speakers who will discuss real-world examples of innovative and unique facade designs that are taking advantage of emerging technologies and pushing the boundaries of traditional construction. Our speakers will outline best practice, design and construction considerations, sharing case studies throughout. The presentation will be followed by a live audience Q&A session at the end, so please hold your questions until then. I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Chris Hube. Chris is an associate in Arabs Victoria and South Australia Buildings Group. Chris has a background in architecture, facade engineering and building envelope consulting. Chris's skills include project and design management for challenging and culturally significant projects of varying scales. This comes from his experience in Australia, the UK, Europe, Canada and the Middle East. Working on projects that span the commercial, arts and culture, R&D, education, residential and transport sectors. Chris brings a collaborative and adaptive approach to all his projects, tapping into Arab's multidisciplinary offering. He ensures that solutions are holistic and always best for the project. Welcome to you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Chris Hube. I'm an associate with uh, Arup in Melbourne here, working in the buildings uh, group and focusing on facade engineering uh, within that discipline. I'm going to run through today um, with Alyssa uh, the what is facade design and go through in a little bit more detail of what what we do and how we go about it um, and then actually talk through a little bit at the very end of some of the challenges and kind of uh, opportunities for innovation but first off i want to just actually discuss what is a facade um, we can we tend to just generalize this uh, and just kind of consider it as um, as only the vertical front of a building. But it actually is a bit more than that. And when we talk about facades, and you'll see it throughout um, my presentation, to, in today's world, we're actually talking more about the building envelope, the full aspect of, the, of a building that separates the inside from the outside. Now, a building envelope can, uh, is considered uh, a, a lot of components. Uh, we have different ones, such as the below ground construction, we have external walls, we have openings through those walls, includes roofs, as well as some of the ancillary kind of elements such as balustrades or shading elements or other kind of projections that come off the building that aren't actually achieving the enclosure, but is actually an extension of that building envelope. And this is important to just uh, distinguish this, that you know, facades aren't just the vertical elements anymore, they're a lot more complicated and there's a lot more to consider. So this is just, I'm going to call this a short list of all the considerations we need to consider within the building envelope. 
they are quite complex and there's a lot to take in. Um, and here's, okay, I'm talking about weather tightness, the structural behavior, how we actually connect with the primary structure, thermal losses or gains, so from solar or from like heating, occupant comfort, how the user feels within the space, energy and material efficiencies are becoming more and more important. The isolation, so you know, looking at the exposure of the building and what do we need to do to shade it? What kind of glass selection do we need to do? Condensation and ventilation. Durability is very important when we're looking at improving the longevity of our, uh, of our buildings. We need to make sure that the other aspects, not just the structure, can actually last longer. Sustainability, and this can, can is kind of tied in with energy efficiency, but it also is a bit broader than that. And I'll go into a few more details um, and, and show you what that means a bit later. Daylight, fire behavior, acoustic performance, safety, security, maintenance, and buildability. And it goes on and on. Um, what I'm going to do is walk through and kind of tell you actually what it means to be a facade engineer in that world and deal with all those complexities and different parameters. So a facade engineer isn't necessarily just an engineer anymore. We're, we're a collective of disciplines and backgrounds. Some of us come from architecture, some from mechanical engineering, some come from materials background. Some of us are actually ex um, fabricators or from the uh, contractor side of things and have dealt with a lot of design. Some come from more testing and prototyping. It's a, it's a big collection of individuals that make up facade engineering disciplines. And you know, our teams are ever more important to be able to deal with all these complexities in a really detailed way. I'm gonna walk through our design process uh, using projects. And I'm, not, and I'm gonna to try to emphasize and kind of show you how each facade is not the same. They may look the same when you walk through the streets and through the city, but actually each one has gone through a series of very different considerations. So an example here is 80 Collins. You know, it's a new commercial tower. Um, you, we see a lot of you know, glass towers within all the city centers. But you, you can see in this one, you know, we have a commercial um, curtain wall system that's actually got different surfaces. You know, and a tower is no longer just a simple set of glass anymore. There's a lot more other things that we're considering. So you have Bosco Verticale with you know, these balconies and um, um, uh, planters with all the, the trees in it. They're actually providing shading, which is ever, ever more important when we're considering thermal heat, uh, heat losses and gains. Or that we're having you know more added elements and really larger sunshades that are you know articulate a certain style. This one was you know a very complex one where we have a, a sloping down facade, and we had to kind of change the curtain wall system to be slightly different in different locations. So what's happening further up the building isn't the same as what's happening below, requiring a little bit more steel work to offset that kind of angled out appearance. But we also have, you know, with commercial um, uh, developments like the Carlton Connect in uh, the University of Melbourne is you have precinct design. You have one developer designing multiple buildings within the same master plan. You, when we look at procurement, procurement's becoming ever more important to ensure that our facades can actually perform and we can actually get the value for money that um, is intended to make the development viable. So, and when you look at the kind of differences in the appearances and what that actually looks like when you come to putting it onto the building, there's a lot that goes in behind these to make it as efficient as possible and work through a lot of these intricate details, so providing sunshades to mitigate the heat gains, providing a base system that you know that they can go overseas and procure it from either a single supplier, which was our uh, original thought, or what they ended up doing is going to four different suppliers for the facade in this particular project. And we, what we can't control is the market at the time of procurement. Another tower is where we have really complex geometry. Crown Resort in Sydney is uh, going to be a mixed use building. It's gonna have entertainment at the bottom, 
a mid-level um, tower of, of hotel and then high high-end residential on the very top. As you can see from this, it curves up as it moves further up the, the tower, which is creating so many complexities when you consider you're trying to uh, uh, introduce an economical curtain wall system into a curved geometry. So using uh, analysis to determine the viability of different systems, looking at how we can um, apply certain kind of rational surface treatments and uh, more flat panels, and actually avoid waste by too many different size panels is quite important at early stages. And we're reliant on going, uh, going into a lot of detailed geometry analysis to try to mitigate waste and actually look at the viability of, um, of different uh, opportunities and what we know we can get from conversations with the supply chain, as well as being able to articulate the information back into documents so a contractor can pick it up and actually know what level of risk to allow for. Not all facades are, are the same, as I was saying earlier. And you know, the previous ones were all looking at glass and aluminium. But the you know, more buildings we have, the more interesting materials we use. And materials is such an important part of the facade. And it's really important to select the right material for the, the project, the client, and the architect. This is a residential project, which is using contemporary stone, a really heavily airtight facade. and a really good thermal insulation and thermal breaks at uh, certain locations to mitigate the thermal bridging and heat losses. This is another project in the New Scotland Yard, um, which was a refurbishment and renewal. It was contemporary stone and insulation and had curtain wall all incorporated into one. Not, not a simple uh, complex, uh, a simple system and a lot of complexity involved in this because you don't have economy of scale like you would with a tower to deal with just a commercial uh, wall. You don't just have a lot of stone that you can actually get a decent procurement from. You're having to actually do a lot of bitty stuff and apply it into, into the system and go through quite a bit of analysis. This was part of the analysis of the thermal barrier of applying new insulation having to look at how you introduce new uh, glazing systems into an existing 1920s stone facade, to looking at the, the new curtain wall with particular sunshades and actually introducing a lot more solid insulated panels to just offset heat gains and heat losses to main, maintain the energy efficiency. And then applying new stone on the top to an existing structure um, and dealing with all those kind of uh, new build movements and existing structure movements. What we're finding is that you know, with materials, old is new again. It's, it's no longer about you know, what's the, the latest engineered aluminium panel. It's actually looking back at what was kind of done in the past. And we're finding this is really important from a planning point of view and actually building our cities to be more livable and enjoyable. This project in London is looking at, uh, it might look old, but it's actually brand new. It's just opened up last year. These are actually self-supporting brick arches and brickwork all, all included in here, plus the, the self-supporting pendentive domes. Really interesting detail, beautiful finish, looks like something that came from the 1800s, but it was just built last year. The difficult part with this was actually finding how do we achieve uh, an old looking building with new technology? And we had to go through a few different iterations. So this was the first scheme which was actually built, was looking at self-supporting brickwork, so very old age technology, very old age methodologies and installations. But we needed to int introduce a really thick, continuous thermal insulation throughout. We also looked at new age technologies, making the brick arches and the brick domes out of precasts with just a brick finish. But the interesting thing is, um, was that from a procurement point of view, we couldn't actually procure it because there wasn't enough of these arches. There was only, a, uh, there was only eight of them in total. And you know, there wasn't enough there to have an economy of scale to go to a big producer. So in the end, we had to actually look at the traditional ways of doing brickwork and actually imposing that into a very contemporary building. Had to go through prototyping and small scale to ensure that we could get the look and feel right and test if we could actually build it. 
to actually modifying the structure to provide holes in the slab to allow for the height of the domes to actually penetrate through the, the roof system, which changed the whole lateral restraint uh, approach for the main structure. To actually introducing insulation and air tightness membranes around all the brickwork to ensure that we're meeting the, the energy efficiency targets and the air tightness we were um, envisioning. Unfortunately, and I felt really terrible about this, but we had to get them to build this portion of the, the pendant of dome three times just to ensure they got the right thermal continuity and thermal breaks um, that were uh, agreed to and um, calculated. But in the end, you end up with this beautiful finish. Not an easy process. And I'll show you actually a few more examples of how we have to go through a very methodical approach to this. This project is still under construction. It's a massive hole in the ground um, and the, the, the structure is only coming uh, up above the, the ground floor plane. This project was all about the, a really nice look and feel, a bit of a thermal mass to improve the, the sustainability, ample daylight, but also a really warm environment. And using timber was actually a great approach very thermally efficient, a lot more so than um, aluminium. But we also had this perforated concrete that was providing a shade to it to mitigate the amount of heat gains in the Jerusalem environment. Mock-ups and prototypes were very important in this. Uh, because we were doing a very challenging design, we had to slowly work through the local procurement options from a very early stage, pretty much from the, the very beginning at Schematic Design, working through small scale, eventually getting up to larger scale, getting a few contractors to try out what they could do, applying different methods of um, finish approach, as well as how you'd connect different panels together, to larger scale, which was about one story, and then applying actually different stone types and different stone finishes as we were kind of continuing through the process. But it had to go through a very particular agreement with the client for them to buy into this. And that's actually probably a lot of what we do is making sure the client's aware of decisions and getting them uh, comfortable with those is a really good approach from a, a risk mitigation point of view, but we can also talk about the safety of it. Locally in Melbourne, we're working on the Melbourne Metro project. This is one of the stations, this is Arden, or which will become the North Melbourne station. Very large brick uh, brickwork here. And we're looking at brick face precast, not typical within the Australian market, but something that's becoming more and more prevalent. And this goes back to my earlier point of old is new again. It's quite a beautiful kind of approach here, but this arch is both architectural, it's structural, and it's a facade all at the same time. So hard for three very individual disciplines to kind of have an overall responsibility for it. A lot of kind of background work into providing the right brick set out, how we can actually procure the brick, how do we embed the brick into the precast to ensure it doesn't dislodge from a safety point of view, is a, a lot of what we actually went through. It looks very simple from that point of view, but then when you actually throw everything else on top of it, it becomes a very complex thing to work through. Also in the Metro project is we're dealing with below ground design. So we have cladding that's going to actually um, line some of the uh, below ground caverns and tunnels. And we have these beautiful arched metalwork. Looks fairly straightforward. You kind of see some bends. We've seen bend and metalwork before. But the thing that's actually one that we have to really consider is from a fabricator point of view, can they achieve, achieve those bends? Can locally, can we achieve those? Can we achieve those bends overseas? Can both actually achieve them? And then how do we articulate this back to them of how a fabricator can actually pull this together? We can only you know, in, incorporate so much of uh, aspects in the design. There's still a, a, a big part of what goes through it that needs to be working with a fabricator and a contractor to ensure that we meet certain limitations or we kind of economize on certain opportunities that, they, um, that they're better at or they have a bit of a know-how or they've done a recent project on. It's a very collaborative process. And is, and is not something that's as typical to other, other disciplines. This example, we were going through a lot of 3D um, documentation to kind of show them how the different parts and components work together, how different finishes are applied, how we deal with tolerance, what kind of rough sizing we've looked at, 
How do we get uh, connections that can deal with varying geometry? Is something that's more, becoming more and more difficult in, the, in this uh, day and age uh, to show innovation. This project you might not think is actually a facade. So this is the largest statue in the world in India. It's the Statue of Unity. It's a bronze um, cladding over a concrete uh, base. It's not a building in its such. It's, it's a statue where you can actually go into it and have a view, view of the surrounding area. And it was a very tricky one for us to deal with because we had a lot of steelwork, four layers of steelwork at least, just to get out to that outer surface. When you consider how tall this is, this is about the size of the Gherkin in London. You have to uh, panelize this into smaller panels to be able to produce a lot of the intricate kind of uh, surfaces and geometry. Then you need to be able to lift it into place and connect it into the base structure. You have a very tall cantilevering structure, so it's going to move up that height. So you need to allow for the different movements between um, kind of structural components. In this, uh, in, in this image, you can kind of start to see where we had what we called mega panels and mini panels. You can see there's about three or uh, nine panels per, uh, per mega panel. There's three rows of three. Those were all connected together onto a base steelwork and then lifted into place. And then we had to allow movement between each of those mega panels. And you can see here, even incorporating buttons, how do we actually form this into a material? So the bronze itself was very particular. You had to look at the right alloy type, had to go to fabricators' um, factories to view how they were um, uh, melting uh, and forming these panels to actually looking at how they pre-finished them to ensure that it had um, a good appearance to it from day one. And actually how all the different layers of steelwork came to sight. So you have to do, you have the smaller panels coming and then you have to bring them together to form one mega panel and then apply that onto a steel backing. Required a lot of 3D complicated engineering, drafting, design work just to make that work. You can hear, see here with the, the base of his smock, the buttons that we just saw earlier, the kind of level of detail on the back of the, of the steelwork to kind of deal with the geometry and to deal with certain movements of thermal, structural movements. Um, how do you maintain waterproofing so you're not getting air, or sorry, water into the, the system? It was quite complex. So just a quick summary of what facade design is. It's, it's not just about code compliance. That is important, it's essential within the building industry, but it's about sustainability as well. Are we using materials efficiently? Are we ensuring that our buildings don't have a lot of energy use over its operation? Is the material in the system appropriate? Have we considered all the safety aspects? And that's not only just from the contractor's perspective or the occupant, but also the people who maintain the buildings. What's the risk? Is the client willing to buy into something more risky? Procurement, procurement, procurement. Can you actually procure the system? Have you tested the market? Weather and air tightness and insulation are ever more important. Durability, maintenance, and replacement we need to consider. Fire performance and combustibility is ever more important. You'll hear that in the news. So that kind of goes back to the appropriate materials and systems. Have we considered what is essential? and contract responsibilities between the design and the contracting. Are they the same? Are they individual components? How does that all work together? And within our facade industry, that's not as black and white, and it needs an appropriate conversation from the beginning. I'm just gonna end on looking at a bit of the future, talking uh, about some of the challenges and using what I've just presented to kind of show you um, what we feel um, that is difficult to work through, but also where the opportunities are to innovate and continue to, to push the boundaries. So we've, you know, in the past, we've looked at traditional brickwork and we worked our way through to smart buildings and double skin facades. And now we're looking actually, what is the supply chain and what is the occupant's interests? very different to what we were doing before. The you know, before was a little bit more energy centric. And now we're actually looking at, you know, how, how are occupants feeling in that? Are they comfortable? Does it suit them? Is it making them happy? 
And we're looking at a lot more digital tools to assess all of that. So I think in the future, we're still going to, we're going to need to continue to invest and commit to testing and prototyping. And we need to walk the client through that. And that's going to be a lot, a harder process, something they're not familiar with in a lot of other uh, aspects, maybe a little bit more in the interior side of things, uh, interior design, where they go through like sampling and stuff like that. But this will be ever more important on the uh, facade. Building those up into larger panels, going into full scale, really ensuring that we go through this process methodically to ensure it's kind of uh, checked off. And this will actually mitigate a lot of the risk with innovation, but because we can bring the, the contractors and the procurement and supply chain along that process as well. Doing actual testing, you know, this is an example of weather and air tightness testing of a door set. This is another one on a full scale um, curtain wall for one of the towers in the city here. And we're gonna go through fails, it's gonna leak, and, but that's part of the process. And we need to allow that time to do it. We need to allow that opportunity because from a fail, we learn. What we wanna ensure is that we're not learning on the side of the building while it's being installed. We're learning before that and we can correct those in time. So in, in future projects, a bit more early contractor involvement is probably gonna be seen as well. Testing needs to consider safety. <clears throat> this is skylights being tested for impact resistance. You know, we, there's um, a few approaches here that are actually well built up in the UK. And also testing other brittle materials like stone. It should be ensured that, that these are actually completed to um, mitigate any problems in the future. You know, when you have buildings that are over footpaths or around public environments, this will be in, um, necessary to mitigate any risk. So looking at testing even for physical damage and physical break-in and security, becoming more important on certain uh, building types like museums or um, banks, or you might find in airports, and actually using a certain uh, suite of materials. This, this um, tool set here is for actually you know, break-ins and looking at the physical resistance. There's a European approach, and that's one thing that we'll we're looking at right now is in facades there's not just necessarily an Australian way of doing it there's a New Zealand way there's a, a North American way there's a European there's a UK way and that's a bit of the hard bit is that you need to know those different opportunities and uh, approaches to be able to you know, educate our clients better digital tools with BIM and I think Alyssa is going to touch on this a bit later are going to be needed to articulate the complexities looking at digital tools from a, a thermal and a daylighting perspective to parametric tools to do you know, material analysis and structural stability analysis, but also looking at optimization. Uh, this is an example of you know, balancing daylight and glare and solar heat gains, uh, all within you know, to provide um, evidence back to the design team and the client to make informed choices in an earlier stage to actually doing you know, um, thermal assessments to understand um, it, you know, how much insulation to apply to actually meet or exceed current requirements, but also to look at what those surfaces are to see how cool or hot they, they might be. And this is important to improve the energy efficiency of our systems, to improve the air tightness of our systems, but we also need to be careful that we can actually achieve this through membranes and maybe different system um, setups. And this is something that the current supply chain in the local market is just getting up to speed on. We also need to be careful about penetrations and how thermal barriers extend through that and protect them and don't mitigate uh, or, and, and mitigate water ingress issues and prevent condensation from occurring. We can have condensation on the surface of uh, systems. We can also of condensation inside of solid systems and that can be really problematic. The other thing I think that's going to be seen as a challenge but also a massive opportunity for, for innovation is that our industry continues to decarbonize. We know the energy market is decarbonizing and that's got a plan but the facade industry from a design fabrication will need to really consider how we do things. You know, natural ventilation is becoming uh, more important to improve energy efficiency and occupant well-beings. How do we do that effectively and still provide air seals and weather performance? 
to integrating energy generation within our systems. Uh, this is building integrated PVs. Uh, you know, we're seeing that on roofs, and that's quite normal in the Australian market, but are we integrating more opportunities within the facade? And the PV technology is improving uh, every, every month, every year. Uh, to improve performance and also opportunities for a bit more architectural appearances. Looking at circular economy, so this is an approach where we're actually looking at maximizing the value of materials to their, to their um, greatest potential to allow for the future reuse of that material as it is. It's got value as, as a window system today as it will have as value as a window system in 20 years and allowing for particular replacement on some materials that can't last that long, but also allowing the opportunity that that system doesn't have to be recycled, it can actually be reused and actually kept. The longer we can maintain the durability of a system, the less um, kind of uh, wasted material there is. And that's a kind of an idea of what we're considering from a decarbonizing point of view is also looking at the amount of raw materials going into it and our manufacturing technologies. Aluminium is actually energy intensive. In this, uh, locally, it doesn't have a lot of you know, recycled content in it because there's not enough you know, um, recycled material available to actually improve that. So we're using raw materials in this energy intensive approach that is just you know, burning fossil fuels and actually you know, impacting the you know, climate change. I think we're also going to be looking at other digital technologies to improve supply chain efficiencies. There's quite a good report on looking at blockchain that, uh, which comes from the cryptocurrency um, um, technologies and actually how that could actually make supply chains more efficient to utilize opportunities in space from logistics or manufacturing to improve how quickly things can come to sight, as well as improve our economies and improving our use of materials. And the other one that's really important to me is the introduction of biodiversity more within our facade systems. We're used to green facades and uh, what those are is kind of you know, green walls, but actually being more specific about that, but looking at biodiversity from a point of view of improving our cities to adding, um, flora and fauna into, into the buildings um, to ensure that we recreate the habitat that we once destroyed years ago and ensuring that you know, potentially maximizing the surface area uh, of where we have solid um, uh, wall systems to improve thermal insulation, to ensure that we're using species of plants that isn't harmful or um, that actually maybe could bring back you know, insects and wildlife, like, um, so butterflies or the or ladybirds, or even actually habitat for bats or certain types of birds, so they can flourish across the city again to make an extension of the park and the uh, living landscape. And the other one is our contribution to a global initiative and commitment to the sustainable development goals uh, through the UN. And we can do this in a lot of different areas. Facade systems are actually, a lot of them in this region are procured from overseas and maybe partnering with some of those overseas um, uh, countries, locations, uh, people who build them to actually improve where they live uh, and maybe actually mitigating some poverty or hunger or actually improving their well-being, or maybe even those communities improving their climate action approach. We can do this and introduce it with it. It takes a very different approach to it, and it's not just about the nuts and bolts. It's about a broader conversation. And we can get our clients involved in this, and we can consider this in our designs. It's not necessarily about the glass and aluminium, but it's actually how that glass and aluminium comes to us and is put on the side of the building. So with that, I just want to thank you for uh, your time, and I hope that was quite interesting, and I'm sure you'll have a few questions that we'll discuss a bit later. Thank you, Chris, for a great presentation. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Alyssa Sterling. Alyssa is the Regional Manager for Victoria at Inhabit Group. With a formal background in architecture and construction management, Alyssa leads facade design and delivery across a variety of high profile projects for the Melbourne office. Alyssa has an extensive understanding of how facade systems are influenced by structural, mechanical, energy thermal, daylighting, acoustic, fire and budget considerations. 
and how they impact the facade design outcome. Alyssa's in-depth knowledge of both the local facade market as well as the capabilities of international players offers insights into facade procurement and delivery. She uses this knowledge to convey understanding to project teams throughout the design process. Welcome, Alyssa. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to join your facade discussion as part of, part of the Engineers Australia Infrastructure Thought Leaders series. Today, I, I've broken down the synopsis um, into three questions. Um, the first, best practice in facade design, the challenges facing conventional facade design and innovation in facade design and technologies. So around best practice, um, I want to consider what best practice is in Australia and how do we deliver that, the best practice um, and not just design it. I think as engineers, we often get, um, we lose control of our design with the design construct model of our procurement. And so I just want to go through a few things on, on a project where we had a really great outcome. Um, the ch in challenges with facing conventional facade design, um, look, I'm going to look at design and complex geometry and some of the technologies that um, we're using in that and pushing the boundaries on material engineering. And then lastly, I just want to look at um, BIM and BIM and facade engineering and facade design, how the industries, where the industry's at, um, both uh, globally and Australia, um, and just discuss where we actually think it's useful and where it's not, and what are the main goals in, in using BIM in facades. The first um, project I want to look at is the bon Monash Biomed Centre, designed by Denton Cork Marshall, um, built by Multiplex, um, and probably one of the best projects I've seen from a holistic design team um, bringing together a really great result. Uh, and the main thing I want to focus on here is best practice in facade design. Um, the initial briefing session that we were provided by Monash was that this project was to be um, form one of the buildings um, of their low carbon emissions initiative that they're rolling out on their Clayton campus, um, where they were uh, minimizing the energy use of buildings right across um, their campus. And at the time, Monash had a few passive house projects um, in the pipeline, and they wanted to use this project, which was going to be constructed first, as a bit of a um, as a project to test some of the principles in passive house and Passive house certification is a great tool, and um, but we're not going to get every project to be passive house certified in Australia. We need to make sure that we understand the, the principles um, and how they relate to the different uh, regions within Australia and climates. Um, but what was really what's really key in passive house is um, how they are how the design is transferred through to the actual commissioning and and running of the building and the results that we see in passive house certified buildings is that design and as built are really quite closely aligned. Um, and so taking those principles and applying them to all of our projects is um, the, the theme of, of what was happening here at the Monash Biomed project. Now, and we can really simply bring those three things to three principles for our facade. The first being air tightness, the second thermal bridging, and lastly, shading. Um, air tightness is looking at the whole building air leakage. So we're not looking at um, facades in isolation, but how that they actually interact and um, interface with other parts of the building and each other. And as part of um, the Biomed project, um, we looked at some targets and we, and what's really key with air tightness is, and I like to use the analogy between the, the plastic poncho and the Gore-Tex raincoat, we don't want to create, and especially here in Melbourne's environment where the project was located, we don't want to create this plastic wrapped bubble or, or metal wrapped bubble, whatever it is. We need a building that can breathe. Um, you know, we need a building that's designed to have openings where they're useful. We need a building, especially in residential or buildings that create a lot of moisture internally, we need them to, to moisture vapour to be able to breathe through the walls. So air tightness is not about just wrapping something and making it airtight, but it's also you need to consider um, how 
vapor moves in and out of the building. Um, but what's really key is, is those interfaces and, and the performance of things like doors and penetrations and how we're sealing around penetrations. And the graph on my right um, shows that there, you know, buildings in Australia are performing really poorly when we actually test them. Um, business as usual is not meeting code compliance, um, which we're looking at about around 10 metres cubed per hour per metre squared. Um, but, you know, this project, we had a, a target of three and we made it just, we got 2.8, I think. Um, but I think realistically somewhere around the five, I think is a really good target for us to be trying to achieve. Um, but the key thing is that we're actually testing and we're upholding those requirements to our builders to make sure that what we're designing is, is being translated through to the actual performance of the working building. This is a little test um, that we, uh, sorry, some images of the test. Um, you literally put some fans in some, in the door openings and you, there's a few penetrations and stuff within this, in the testing requirements that you can seal off. But essentially you just make sure all your doors and windows are closed. Um, you turn the fans on, It'll sound a little bit like this. And then you pressurise um, the building up to about 50 pascals. You then just let, um, you stop the fans and you understand how, or, or you maintain, you, sorry, you, you let the pressure drop and then you understand how quickly air is leaking out of the building. Um, it's important to understand the leak of the building, the more fans that you need to get to 50 pascals. And we've, we've tested quite a few projects um, over the last few years. And um, those that haven't had stringent quality control checks during the construction process that have actually been quite leaky, we haven't even been able to get 50 pascals um, during the test. So we've had to extrapolate data to try and understand how leaky they are. That becomes really difficult. But essentially, it's really about interfaces, looking at doors, looking at penetrations and how we're detailing them and also how that's being translated through into the quality of construction because our facade systems as an entity within itself usually perform quite well and not are not the issue with air tightness. The second thing we looking at was thermal bridging. A thermal bridge is an area of the building which has a significantly higher transfer um, than the surrounding materials due to gaps reduction in insulation or a change in facade types. And for, for our facade systems, framing is always our, our weakest element. Um, for the BLT building, we, we did a few things, quite, quite a few um, methodologies to, to reduce our thermal bridging. And it wasn't around just putting fancy um, thermal breaks or, or you know, using, um, it, was just, it was just more about good design and understanding how we can reduce thermal bridging by some of the choices that we make through early design. So things like um, making what we call a thermally enhanced facade. So trying to reduce the amount of aluminium that's exposed um, to the outside, bringing your glass forward, introducing gaskets and clips, um, polyamide clips and beads and stuff like that to reduce the thermal bridging capacity. Um, the other thing is um, looking at the panel size. So obviously we have to off have an offset of efficiencies against structure, but um, from a framing um, and heat loss point of view, the less, least amount of framing um, is better. So looking at big panels, we also um, used blind transoms instead of expressed transoms. Um, again, just eliminating that exposure of and transfer of heat through to the, the metal. Um, and on this project, we also eliminated shading, external shading devices. I'm not saying external shading devices are bad, they have a very good use. We just have to make sure that when we are applying them on our project, we're understanding that although that they're positive in providing shading, that they also are reducing um, or introducing thermal bridging. So we just need to make sure that we're careful in selection of how we're applying them. Shading is another thing that we, I think is critical for our Australian climate. Um, whenever we're designing shading and from an energy point of view, always shade outside first, in line second and internally third. But with this project, um, there's Stan and Marsha had a clear vision of this building, um, having no external attachments. So, um, and also 
they also bring in, as we just discussed, thermal bridging issues and also maintenance and access issues. Um, so we quickly went to um, looking at inline um, shading devices, so things that were in the glass plane. We looked at ceramic fruit. Um, we looked at interstitial blinds, such as um, the blinds here that we put in the Monash Learning and Teaching Building, which was a, that was actually just a, a mesh, a copper mesh. Um, but we also put like interstitial blinds, the little um, uh, tilting blinds that can go in the cavities that we do a lot in hospitals um, for infection control to give privacy. And we also looked at thermochromic glass, um, which is a project the NDI Center, NDIS Center that um, just finished in Geelong where we actually, it, it's glass that actually reacts to the weather patterns outside. So when we're getting a higher intensity of sun, then the, the, um, the tint in the glass increases to, to reduce the solar gains. But ceramic frit on this project lent itself quite well to the design intent. So we started looking at modeling ceramic frit and how its performance worked um, as a shading device. And because of the nature of the use of this building being spaces within of laboratories um, and corridors, then the density of frit we could have quite quite dense. So from a shading point of view, it was actually quite um, an efficient way to shade. And lastly, here's just an image of the back of the building. We've got some perforated mesh screens where the plants sit. Um, but again, a really great collaboration between the project team and an amazing uh, before and after the concept renders really um, came through in the as built condition. The next project I'd like to um, present is the 380 Lonsdale Street. It's a curved glass tower that's just about finished um, in Melbourne. And this was designed by Alan Berg Fraser um, with the client who thought of being the Brady Group. I love this project because we actually got curved glass built in large quantities. That so often we get curved glass projects come in and it gets value engineered to faceted by the time it's constructed. But Brady Group were really um, committed in delivering this project with curved glass and so uh, and a really great result in the end. But what was really clear quite quickly was the complexity of the geometry in this project. It, it doesn't look at it at first, but when you have concave panels, convex panels, flat panels, and they're all stepping in and out in different configurations up the building, we quickly had to start modeling everything in 3D, straight right from concept, just to try and understand how the geometry worked. And here you can see, in 2D, we started trying to understand how we might make this into a unitized panel for the ease of construction in a tower and the pros and cons and how we might attach it to the, the primary structure to go through with the developer and builder. But we, what we really understood quickly was that um, everything had to be designed in 3D. We used Rhino in this case. Um, another thing that we had to do a lot of in this project with samples. So I've never seen so many glass samples built for a single project before we actually started a full scale manufacturer. But, um, you know, you can understand that there's complexities in glass curving. This glass was produced by Taiwan Glass. They brought special, a new um, machine just to curve the glass. This was technology, which is a roller curver, which is allows them to do a lot more, a greater scale and accuracy um, you can also slump glass where you create a mould and you heat it up and slump it over the mould. But um, the roller gave them the ability to deliver the scale of this project. Um, but you can also understand the complexities of curving glass. This also had laminated panels. So we had to deal with, you know, a laminated panel also being um, sealed into a double glazed unit. And each of those three lights will have a different curvature to allow it to fit within the unit size. So huge amounts of samples, huge amounts of quality control. And the image on the right there is the visual mock-up. And then during construction, a few images of, um, you know, we had to curve aluminium and although aluminium's not hard to curve, but um, extruded aluminium's hard to curve. So we had to do it in two bits and put them together. Um, but a really great outcome from a project, which was, um, you know, 
quite for Australia quite a um, innovative project. I'm going to quickly um, go through a couple of mesh screens that we've um, been working on uh, universities and their mesh screens. We've done heaps of mesh screens at universities lately. Um, this is a screen at the Monash University Chancellery. Um, it was designed by ARN and it obviously you can see it's like a, a complex geometry kind of folded shape um, fixed onto the facade. There was actually um, two types of profiles for this project. Um, there's also quite a flat fin and um, we although we modelled it using strand we um, we also decided to put it into a wind tunnel test. And the flat fins were tested for deflection and from the deflection data across a range of wind speeds. And the fatigue check was at the welded um, connection joints was calculated. We looked at six and eight mil plate. Um, we tested six and eight mil plate and based on the um, results, we ended up going with eight mil plate. And then also this is the folded profile and we tested it for tip deflection and potential whistling and but the folded shape made it far stronger than the flat panels um, and so we had a lot less fatigue at the connections so that was a project where we used wind tunnel testing to help us analyze it from um, a structural point of view um, we did the same on arts west at melbourne uni where they have um, some really big um, horizontal fins. And this is another project um, with John Wardle Architects, which is Monash Learning and Teaching Building. John Wardle Architects have a signature kind of screen that they often use across their buildings. Um, and here, the, the main design intent was trying to get this scalloped screen, which was perforated to be as light and hanging in air as possible which I think ended up being quite a good result. But obviously perforations, understanding how perforations um, work is difficult. So again, we put it in the wind tunnel test. Um, at whistling was also a very high a key issue for this project, having so many small um, diameter holes right around the building. So um, one of the bigger drivers for the wind tunnel test. Um, now, lastly, I just wanted to touch on BIM and um, how we're using BIM or how, how we're looking at BIM across the globe, but also here in Australia. So generally, we're finding there's a much bigger uptake in BIM in other parts of the, country, in other part, other parts of the world. Um, I think that's probably because of the scale and complexity of projects. We don't have, you know, some of the the scale of the projects in the Middle East and other parts of the world um, probably lend itself to using facade BIM modelling a lot more. But there are a few parts of our industry which it is really useful. I just want to go through quickly where we see um, BIM and facade and what the components are. But um, so obviously LOD 100, 200, we're just looking at geometries. Um, we often can create families, um, especially up to, to 300 LOD, um, LOD 300, um, create families that we can then hand over to the architect to use in their model. And that gives them a far greater accuracy in their facade componentry within their um, models. Um, and in up to LOD 300, we start, we just include things like mullions, transom glass, cladding and fins, just in a geometric in, um, configuration for information for the model. Um, when we start looking at LED 400, we obviously start looking at um, how it's connected back. Um, even 350, we start looking at how it's connected back from a ge geometric um, point of view. But LED 400, we're starting to get into fabrication. So we start adding in um, brackets, castings, back pans, insulation, notching holes, and all those other things that um, we actually need the information to put, to put into um, production. And then lastly, we have LED 500 which we start porting or, um, information for maintenance programs, warranty information and stuff like that. And the key thing when we're using BIM with facades is really understanding what the end user wants and whether they want what the information we're importing is, is useful to them. Because 
if we are asked to do an LOD 500 facade model, it, there's so much time it takes to put input that information. Um, the cost ends up being quite high. So we're going to make sure that the end user is actually going to use that model with that information. Otherwise, the client's wasting their money. So it's really important to really understand where we're, what the focus is and why we're doing facades with BIM because you can see that there's a lot of detail in it. Um, the, a couple of key lessons that we've learned are um, who is reviewing BIM. So we really make, need to make sure that the BIM manager is reviewing BIM because set out and all those sorts of things are so much more important. Um, and, and also, as I said, the output. So making sure that it's discussed what the output is and, and the use of that output. One of the things we have seen a huge amount of um, uptake in BIM modelling is actually due for fabrication um, where we actually build the model um, in SolidWorks for use in direct fabrication. So this is a project um, that was completed probably two or three years now, um, which is a banister down this area in North, Northcliffe in Western Australia. And it, it what we did here was we modelled um, for the fabricator all the panels in um, uh, SolidWorks and then that allows us to provide then direct input into their CNC machines for cutting. It also allows us to produce 2D shop drawings for construction and review. Um, the, it also, we can also create surfaces for clash detection um, and, and bill of materials for costings. So we're actually finding this, especially with the rollout of all these recutting projects, because of the combustibility issues, we're seeing a, a greater uptake in, in this type of modelling um, because it's really showing some efficiencies in, in um, manufacture and fabrication. So it's, it's a real a great tool for our fabricators. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to share this little photo. I love it. It's a photo from one of our team members a few weeks ago um, and how how our industry's had to adapt to the COVID-19 that we're all experiencing right now while we all sit at home this evening and listen to our presentations. Um, but, you know, I see that there is a silver lining in this and, and the way we communicate and the technologies that we use, I think will be something that we continue through um, when we do get past the, the situation that we're in. And um, Pierre will kill me for this photo, but I do. I think it's a great one how quickly our industry, as an industry, we can adapt. And here is um, a couple of our guys from our Sydney team witnessing a site hose test from the comfort of their lounge rooms. Um, and I think it's just a really great way to, um, you know, look at how technology is changing and how we can adapt and 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 not just do business as usual, but look at how we can do things um, differently in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for our speakers tonight and I hope everyone enjoyed that. It's now that time for you to get involved and uh, Alyssa and Chris will come together to take questions from you. Um, if you could please send in any questions for the panel via the chat box on the screen, ensuring you provide your name and who the question is for, if that's a preference. Um, I do have a question I'd just like to give Alyssa. Alyssa can have a little bit of a rest. I've got a, a question for Chris, and this has come in from Farshid in Queensland. And Farshid asks, what should be the design life of the facade? Is it 50 years, like the building design life? If it is 50 years, is it achievable? Thank you. Uh, it's a great question, and a really difficult one on every project. It's the Negotiating the design life is something you, you talk with a client and you agree and then you finally get it to a facade contractor and then you go through another negotiation process. General principle is uh, from our approach and I think it's quite unanimous in the industry is that the base framing should meet the similar design life as the building but you need to recognize in facades there's a lot of unique components, sealants, gaskets, uh, laminated glass, uh, for example, all have a reduced design life. They can't achieve that. So you need to come up with an adequate um, uh, uh, um, 
certain time period that they can be met by uh, most suppliers, as well as consider in your buildings, if you have a component that has a, um, a reduced design life that you need to allow to replace it um, at some point. So you can't lock it all in. Thank you, Chris. Um, Elisa, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, I think that Chris really covered it, but um, it's about the components and how we have maintenance um, regimes to be able to um, make sure that when we're designing, we're, we're considering those components that we have to be able to replace that can't meet the 50 year design life and making sure that that access from outside or inside or wherever it needs to be is accessible and safe to do so, so that we can continue to maintain, <coughs> excuse me, maintain our facades to hit, to eventually get to 50 years. Um, because as Chris mentioned, there's there's many components that um, and that are exposed to UV and things that won't last 50 years by themselves. Thank you, uh, Elissa. Um, we'll stay with you, Elissa. Uh, we have a question that's come in. Um, what is the facade engineer, engineer doing about meeting compliance for slab edge fire rating? BCA requires the fire rated slabs to extend to the facade, whereas many curtain wall designs leaves a 50 to 300 millimetre gap that is not fire rated. In the past, smoke separation has been provided. However, this is not a compliant design. And that's coming from Thomas in New South Wales. Thank you, Thomas. That's a really um, good question because uh, the facade engineer doesn't actually have the um, a role to say in what that is. It actually comes from the um, building surveyor or the fire engineer solution. So we actually find that across our projects, we get different requirements. So. Um, we still do quite often just have smoke seals um, applied, but we are seeing more increasingly fire rated products. Um, typically that is a insulated, fire insulated bat fitting in the slab edge seal. Um, and then there's a, across the top or others just use a steel um, sheet. And, and I think think that over time and, and the nature of what we've seen, we'll see that applied more and more across our projects. Thank you, Elisa. Um, we have a question that's been directed to Chris, um, that it's come in from Mohammed in uh, Queensland, um, asking how have the recent changes, NCC Section J 2019, how will it have an impact on building industry, facade design and traditional practices? So it's a really good question, and it's something that the industry is really uh, starting to grapple with. Um, in both Alyssa and I's presentation, we talked a lot about air tightness, and that's one of the bigger changes, in the, uh, as well as the thermal continuity. So you're finding that the analysis of thermal gradients and the kind of um, details of how efficient um, the systems are is going to become more and more important. So we're finding before where you could have a, a, a thermal um, value for the glazing system, you might have a thermal value for the solid system. You never really had to consider the interface between the two. So in the new NCC, it's really quite important. The, the similar kind of um, approaches from a glazing shading perspective are still there. It's just now considering a bit more holistically and it's a bit more stringent. So it's going to be a, a lot more difficult to kind of achieve it in some areas, as well as trying to consider it as a holistic um, uh, you know, building envelope uh, balance off solid versus glazed is going to become ever more important. Thank you. Um, we have a question that's come through um, from Ariel um, asking, there is no facade testing mentioned in the slide re with respect to air leakage or air balance for air balancing. How do you conduct this testing on other facade materials, i.e. concrete, bricks, or timber? Anna. And whoever wants to pick that one up. Sure, I'll go. Um, I guess uh, there are approaches that you can do to test, um, maybe not the full building, but you can test actually portions of it. Um, 
generally with say like a concrete you're, you're, bit, you're less worried you're a bit more interested in the workmanship of it and you actually might not be able to rely 100 percent on that workmanship so you actually might apply an additional membrane to provide that air tightness from a facade systems point of view um, i showed the large scale prototype testing i showed the door weather testing those account for the air tightness of those elements individually um, but what becomes important is actually the whole building air tightness, uh, which is the blower door test that uh, Alyssa showed there. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question that is from Evan. Evan's in, um, in the ACT and he's asking uh, to Alyssa, what changes are being made to ensure the quality of what is constructed is as per design? In terms of... Um changes sorry. in terms of um changes i'm not sure if we we're seeing we, we're seeing a few changes in terms of um certification through um, the requirements in the ncc and i think this has um come out of the issues we've had around combustible cladding and um so building surveyors have gone away and said um you know, we've got these issues in combustible cladding. What else are we in the introduction of um, certification requested for FP 1.4, which in the building code is um, water leaking leakage or um, ensuring that we don't have water, water leaks in our buildings. So um, the request for a particular person within the project team to certify what's been designed um, is has changed the way that um, we work because as if we're engaged as that certifier then the our commentary around what needs to happen at Hobbs at, um, and all sorts of other elements in the building uh, are being considered at a much greater level because if if um, if our our comments during design aren't picked up in the project then we aren't able to certify it and so that's one thing that's changed um, I think that from a quality, um, we're, we're trying to educate our, our um, clients to try and get our teams to get to factories. Um, Chris mentioned before about taking them through that process to make sure that we're prototyping, we're testing, we're getting people in factories. Um, and although it's not mandated, it, it's really important in our role as, as engineers to make sure that we're showing our clients how important those processes are and we don't try and um, skip them because when we do skip them, it's when we um, have poor outcomes. So communicating those, you know, those steps and how important that we take the time and to build prototypes and test properly is key in ensuring that we get um, quality outcomes at the end of the project. Thank you, Elisa. Um, we are going to trial um, some online polling uh, after the next question, uh, but we have received a very topical question from Hilton. Um, and Hilton's asking, he's put the question to both Chris and or Elisa, to please have advise if you know what's happening with buildings in Australia with flammable cladding. Uh, what has been done to ensure flammable cladding will no longer be used? It's a big topic. Very big topic. Um, I, I, you would see a lot in the news, as you pointed out, that there's a lot of differing um, opinions on it. Um, a lot of, some of the states have actually created what they call task force to look at how they deal with the buildings that have combustible cladding on it. Um, and you know, what is the approach to rectify if deemed uh, necessary? From a, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, uh, from a design perspective, um, we need to really look at the type of material and what it's been tested to and ensure that the materials are being tested properly. So uh, quizzing suppliers a little bit more stringently, um, ensuring that there's a background data to support a design as well as there's background data to support a contractor's final certification are all necessary. And bringing the fire engineer and the building surveyor through that process um, 
is is a good outcome from the from what's occurred um, or maybe before it wasn't quite as robust as that thank you Alyssa, would you like to comment on that yeah i think the key thing is um a couple of things one is um as for site engineers where well, there's no requirement for sign off on a project um and i think that this has highlighted that and therefore um, making sure that there is someone who understands all that data as Chris was discussing, um, is there to provide that information and sign off. Um, I, you know, I can see that being um, rolled out across small projects because traditionally facade engineers are, are, are engaged on the bigger projects and the smaller um, two, three storey residential projects in the burbs might not have somebody on the project who understands that information. And um, I, I think that the other thing is the government is helping those smaller, um, those smaller uh, buildings that have small board body corporates um, through their task force, as Chris mentioned. Um, so to help them in, um, get access and engage to those specialists through um, consortiums. So, consortia, sorry. So I think that's a really great initiative and we'll see a much better outcome and understanding um, within the industry of what's accepted and not accepted and ensuring that we're not getting last minute um, substitutes um, that are being applied to our projects. Thank you, Alyssa. And as I was saying, um, we'll now have a question using our polling technology. So if you could please use your device, mobile, mobile tablet or laptop and go to Menti dot com and type in the code 285480 to, to participate. Um, we'll only have two questions like this tonight, uh, but the first question is, when selecting facade material systems for commercial facade, what are commonly the primary drivers for final selections? So as engineers, I know you'll all participate in this. It'll be interesting to see the results and we will come back to the results after we've had um, another question that is coming in. There's lots of questions coming in, which is very uh, encouraging. And a question that we have that I have been looking at on screen for a while, this is a little bit different. William in the Northern Territory is asking, how can you become a facade engineer if you have a first degree in materials engineering? If anybody would like to uh, answer that question or is able to answer that question? I can do that. Uh, um, the good thing about facade engineering is you don't, there's no, as Chris mentioned in his presentation, there is no one um, formal education to come from. So yes, if you want to be an engineer who crunches the numbers and maybe goes on to be registered um, to do certification for Part B in structure, then you would have to have a um, structural civil um, qualification. But uh, Chris and I both come from architecture design backgrounds. Um, we have in our offices, we have people from fabrication backgrounds, we have people from materials backgrounds, um, all, all sorts of things. So facades um, is really a, a, an experience, uh, sorry, an education on in the office, out on site. Um, there's only a couple of universities around the world who actually provide um, facade specific education. Um, so it's really in on the job training. So if you're interested, and I know that when we're hiring new staff, we look for people who have a passion for facades um, and because that's really important and, and you learn everything while you're working. Thank you, Elisa. Um, we have a great question that has come through um, from Jordan here in uh, Victoria somewhere and Jordan is asking about structural provisions for creep, wind pressures and interstory drift that are not often considered for non-structural elements for the 50 year serv serviceability requirements of fire resistance, moisture and wind penetration of buildings. And the question is, does a facade engineer holistically ensure all of these provisions have been allowed for? And he's directed that to Chris. Um, we do. We have to consider the different movements that occur uh, in a building. 
So you have, uh, as you mentioned there, the primary structure will move and it, floor to floor will move differently. It might shrink over time if, and have creep if it's concrete. Um, the taller the building, you might have a little bit more movement uh, than anticipated. They're all different areas. You also have the cladding itself. Each different material has a different thermal uh, conductivity and will have a thermal expansion and contraction. So we, we in the, it's all encompassing in that appropriate selection of the materials and systems that I mentioned. You do need to consider how you're connecting it back and how you can divide up the, uh, any of the movements or slab deflections. Um, ensure that connections can be adjusted potentially over time or during construction and kind of really understanding how, how things all work. So with all of our systems, if we're not considering movement, uh, then we're, we're not doing our job well. Um, so it, it is a, a, an aspect that probably doesn't get talked about as much as it should, but it is highly considered uh, in our system designs, as well as the um, review and the certification of the installed works as well. Thank you, Chris. Um, we can now put up the results of our first poll. Thank you, everybody who participated. So I think we've, we've got a slight technical issue that I do um, apologise. Um, I might move on to a question that we received from Cassandra in Victoria. Um, and Cassandra's directed this to Alyssa, to what is the current state of composite panel systems in Victoria? So um, the building code still allows you to use composites um, but I, I think that what but it has some provisions around what's allowed but what's really driving our industry is risk um, risk from a client perspective and what they're happy to put up on the building um, because they you know they don't want the, the compliance to change down the track and for them to have issues but also much from an insurance um, perspective um, it is really driving designers and clients to what they are allowed to um, specify. And so we're really re um, seeing a reduction in composites um, where there are risks in combustibility, especially just using solid aluminium sheet, um, just because the uncertainties around um, adhesives and even if they're within you know, the millimeter thickness and and things like that, um, there's just a nervousness and it will probably be a while until the industry feels comfortable to move back into that if they ever do. Thank you. And we can now have a look at the results of our online poll. Thank you. And as you can see, we asked the question of facade material systems for commercial facade, what are commonly the primary drivers for final selections? And it looks like the architect builder specification um, um, sitting equally with price, um, which is um, quite a, an interesting result of that. Um, stay with Menti because we will ask uh, another question um, after this uh, next question that I received from Lexcon, um, who is in Victoria as well, and, and asking what standards are used in the facade design. Is there a minimum requirement for earthquake and wind connection, uh, particularly with fatigue? And he hasn't specified, so whoever would like to pick that question up. Thank you. Uh, that's a, that's a, a really difficult question to answer. There are so many standards that we, we use. We use standards from North America. We use standards from Europe, the UK, our own Australian ones, international standards. Um, and it, it, it's it's really what's kind of a, a bit more purposeful for the project and the type. I guess looking at what you uh, the other aspect of your question about seismic, um, it depends on the project if the seismic requirements are directly and fully imposed onto the facade systems, and it generally tends to be around the use of the building. So, like say, um, hospitals are kind of critical care uh, buildings, you know, within that category that they'll have a higher requirement to resist uh, seismic loads and to prevent them from damage, to allow the building to continue to operate after an event. 
whereas maybe like your garden shed or like you know a smaller kind of warehouse or something like that um, would have less of those requirements in it because if there is a little bit of damage into the the systems themselves the other thing is to consider is depending on the material a brittle material uh, won't be able to accommodate the same amount of uh, movement or um, potential minor damage um, that so meant more of a ductile kind of like metal would and your brittle materials could impose an additional safety hazard if they were to break under those seismic loads so it, it's a really hard one and uh, I think this is a it's a really um, uh, an interesting point that within the Australian market, we don't have a kind of general consensus or like a, a, a body that represents all the interests and improves it. Um, there's a body like that in the UK, the CWCT, that's kind of looked at developing common standards and common approaches. Um, but generally, you find in the industry, um, the facades, uh, it's, it's such a niche and um, it's, it's uh, very small. We all know each other very well. And we all compare our, our kind of general approaches and how we apply kind of loads and different standards. Um, our next polling question, um, which um, this was derived because obviously there's been a lot of topical issues, a lot of press around quality issues in construction around facades. And the question we'd like to ask you all is, what resources do you commonly use as reference when comparing facade materials? And I'll let everybody vote on that. And we'll go to a question that's come in while we're waiting for those um, results. So thank you to everyone for participating. Um, I've received a question from Adam. Um, and Adam, this is quite a question that's come in quite a bit actually. And Adam's asking, is, balcony, is a balcony part of a facade? If yes, what is the main consideration? If not, uh, why not? And it hasn't been addressed to anyone in particular. I can take that one. Um, balconies, um, I think it depends how you define a facade, um, but we definitely get involved in balustrade cladding um, and interface with balconies. So it's very important as a facade uh, designer or engineer to understand um, the function of the balcony, usually it's primary structure. So um, the structural engineer will look after it from a structural point of view, but we're always interfacing our facades um, with the balcony. And so looking at hobs and the heights for waterproofing is important. Looking at um, the um, compatibility of materials, if we're um, applying membranes or fixing to membranes or lapping membranes and also understanding how balconies are drained, um, whether overflows are going through the facade and how we detail that are all important parts of, of um, facade design. And so we do have to understand balconies and um, how they work and the materials used to provide effective and um, facade solutions. And we might just have one more question before we go to the results of the poll. And this has come in from Steve. And um, we've had quite a few questions around the safety. And Steve has asked, what are the typical safety in design consideration in, in facade design? And maybe Chris, would you like to pick this one up? And, sure, yeah. happy to. Um, Yes, a safety in design is required of all designers. Um, so um, and we need to ensure that what we're what we're designing actually can be um, you know lifted by say the contractor installing it. Can it actually be? Can it harm an occupant if they accidentally jump uh, bounce into it? Um, can you actually re uh, replace it if a maintenance person has to go uh, and look at it? Um, so. Safety and design is very important. And we look at it from all those aspects because um, there's so many different users of the interface with that facade. Um, we, we tend to look at it based on the material, the type, its exposure, where it's located, the use of the building. They all kind of change how you, you generally approach it. But you know, as, as Alyssa pointed out with balustrades, it's a prime example of where you go through quite a, a stringent, um, kind of very pointed uh, safety and design approach to look at the materiality of it. So say if it's a glass balustrade, uh, if it was to break, is the person that was um, on that balcony exposed to 
falling from height. So there's particular things you look at of what type of glass you might choose. Um, what's the kind of support system? Those all come into play when we're, we're developing our designs. And it's, it's really kind of um, horses for courses, depending on the type of system or what it, what is, what's being, uh, wh where it is and what type of material. But um, we, we go through that process um, throughout the design um, to ensure that you know, we're, we're providing safe solutions. And you know, sometimes that, that kind of safety and design approach will trump price because you actually, if we had to look at it, what is the best to, for the outcome of the project and to mitigate the risk back to the client and the occupants, sometimes that is the more expensive solution. Thank you. And we'll now have a look at our second polling question. Thank you. So we asked what resources do you commonly use as a reference when comparing facade materials and the response has been overwhelmingly technical manuals so thank you for that um, we've just got time for a couple more questions but I've had an interesting question from um, the ACT from Robert and he puts this question for Chris and Alyssa and, and he's asking what happened to bioadaptive facades like the live algae facade completed in Germany in 2015 and are they still a thing Oh, interesting question. Uh, so that that project was um, a research and development with um, uh, in, in Hamburg. Um, some of the, the feedback from the um, th that project and the kind of under operation is they weren't able to harvest enough of the algae to fuel um, the electricity generation. So you know, it, it's a research and development piece, um, and it's not to say that those kind of um, uh, facade systems can't work in the future. It's just that you know it's, it's, there, there might be other opportunities there. So like, uh, so like say for example with that one is looking at is there another algae you could harvest there and treat it more like an, an urban agricultural uh, production rather than an energy production. Um, and those are things that you know, we're kind of seeing. Another aspect is maybe biomaterials is another one that's uh, kind of along the same lines, uh, but you're finding biomaterials and the combustibility don't tend to match because of the material composition being organic, organic it, tend, it is um, technically combustible to testing. So you just have to look at you know, where those materials might be appropriate. Thank you. Um, Alyssa, oh, that's, and that was a ARIT project, um, I believe. Um, I just wanted to also ask a question on behalf of Engineers Australia. We like to sort of take a futuristic look on behalf of the profession and to both our speakers, um, where do you see facade engineering in the next 10, 20 years? What do you think will be the main trends, um, themes, and how do you think the profession um, will go forward, uh, going forward? Thank you. I'll start if you like. Um, so I think from um, in light of the combustibility issues is um, some the really traditional materials coming back and and we which is a really lovely thing to you know down at um, at the urban level where people are walking uh, aluminium composite panels or any type of aluminium panel isn't really a, a the right material to be applying in in those areas. So bringing back stone and brick and and more um, cementitious type facades, we I think we'll see a lot more of that continue. Um, and I think that's um, not only from a combustible point of view, from an urban environment point of view, is is really key um, in creating lovely places for us to dwell. And um, I think that. We will also see, hopefully see the role of the facade engineer or the facade designer through um, play a, big, a bigger role in certifying um, certain elements. We're already seeing um, waterproofing and building certificate input and um, certif certification and design um, I suppose the design is actually being considered right from the start, but also followed through. So the changes that often occur in design construct um, 
scenarios are not uh, as easy for, for the builders to change because um, we are signing off these, doc uh, these designs at the end of the project. Um, and hopefully we'll see a lot more testing coming in. We, we've talked about the, the um, whole building testing and the uh, NCC has started to bring that in in 2019 as a pathway for clients. And I'm hoping that to see that that will become mandatory in the next um, few years. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. And apologies, we just uh, experienced a few technical difficulties live there. Um, I have got a, a final question, which I thought was a great question. Um, on, over my time at Engineers Australia, I've heard quite a lot in different forms, and it's from John in WA. And John asks, who is the ultimate decider in, design, in the design of a facade? The engineer or the architect? And um, maybe we'll direct that to Chris. Thank you. I would say it's neither. It's it's the client. <laughs> so when we're, when we're engaged uh, to do design, and whether that's design and certification, or um, the the ultimate kind of decider would be the client. Now we're we're trusted advisors and technical advisors to them, so we need to make sure that we're you know have their um, uh, considerations in mind, so risk, safety, cost, etc. Uh, we work with the architects to try to find what's the right fit for their intent. But you know, sometimes uh, the the client will always can always trump either of us, the architect or the engineers. Um, so it, it it can be tricky. Uh, and but I think it, the one unique point of view is that from a certification aspect, there could be times where the certifying engineer could make that final selection, but that's generally from uh, the compliance and um, safety perspective where, where that become really important. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, I'm just looking at the time. That's all, all the time we have for tonight. Um, on behalf of Engineers Australia and all of you who have joined us tonight online, I would again like to thank Chris Hube and Alyssa Sterling for their time, fantastic insights and case, case studies they've shared tonight. Once again, I would like to thank our industry partner, Brickworks Building Products, for making tonight's session possible. Uh, just quickly, I'd just like to highlight the Engineer of the Year um, awards that are coming up. Nominations for Engineer of the Year are currently open. I'm sure there's a lot out of you out there. Um, and please, uh, for information on nomination criteria and submission guidelines, please visit the link on screen. We'd also appreciate it, particularly in these current times, as we're moving everything to our online platforms, if you could complete a short feedback survey about your experience with the webinar tonight. Uh, and there will be a link in the description box below. So again, on behalf of Engineers Australia, I want to thank you for your support and your engagement, and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, webinar. Thank you.